Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and Harley Schlanger is back on tap now. We had uh, some problems last week with connection. Harley, you have two weeks of work to catch up in an hour, so we've got to rumble. Uh, lots of news items going on. The, one of the latest we're going to discuss in Hour 3 with Gary Creep, our attorney uh, expert, is uh, the issue that Obama plans on another attempt to take over the Internet. Uh, we have, of course, the war clouds gathering over the Middle East with the Congress and Senate passing a uh, unanimous bill pretty well. Uh, to squeeze the international financial transactions through the China Bank of Iraq and any institutions, uh, shipping companies, etc., that do interactions with Iran to allow them to, to, to sell their products, uh, their back will be against the wall very, very shortly. And we're facing a, an almost immediate call that was preempted by IDF two weeks ago to start a preemptive air attack on Syria's uh, depots of RDX, VX nerve gas, uh, etc., and to make an Iran attack against the Bush Air Reactor and other so-called weapons missile silos. This is really crazy. It's more dangerous than the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 with uh, John F. Kennedy. This is the guns of war are aimed and ready to fire. Well, this is, of course, the most serious danger right now. But I'll, I'll just start by backing up a second to set the stage for this because uh, the last two weeks we've had a total mobilization to get to the Congress in Washington on two points. One is the need to address the so-called scandals of LIBOR, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Bank Corporation, drug money laundering, the continued bailouts and so on, by putting through Glass-Steagall and a credit policy in NAWAPA 21. And secondly, to stop this war threat, and the most efficient way of doing that is removing Barack Obama. Now, what's interesting, <clears throat> and probably will be a little surprising to some of your listeners, is that whereas in the past we would be able to meet with congressional staffers, but rarely with a member of the House or the Senate, this time there were probably 50, 60 cases of congressmen or senators passing by a meeting, hearing what we were talking about, and then sitting down to engage in a discussion with us. You know, most of these congressional offices have a back door, and a congressman can always slip out the back to avoid a discussion. What we found is that because of the nature of the crisis, and because of how upfront LaRouche is and our organizers are, that congressmen actually wanted to have a discussion. And so at the end of last week, we put out a statement that said Congress must not recess. You can't go home in the midst of these crises. And lo and behold, there was a vote last Friday, and 87 Republicans joined with all the Democrats to vote against a recess, against adjournment. And the reasons given were many. The, the fact that we don't have a farm bill when the farm sector is being destroyed between weather and, and budget cuts and uh, the collapse of the economy, uh, the fires burning out of control in the western states, the uh, requisitioning bill that's going to cut defense spending. There were a number of these issues, including... Geithner's corruption on LIBOR and his responsibility and the fact that he should be removed. So members of the House voted not to adjourn. Now then yesterday, when the House was supposed to go in the session, there was a ruling by supposedly unanimous consent for the House to vote for recess, for adjournment. And when we talked to congressmen, many of them said, I knew nothing about this. I'm opposed to it. We have to be in Washington. We haven't done our job. So what clearly happened is that Barack Obama was freaking out at the fact that the congressmen were talking about Glass-Steagall, about going after Geithner, going after Holder, and about stopping this war threat. And he prevailed upon the leadership, probably with hammers and blackmail and money, to, to call for a new vote and a recess. Because Obama does not want Congress in session now, because it's very possible that during this month of August, and Congress is now out of session until September 10th, that he may either give a green light to Netanyahu to hit Iran, or he may facilitate a U.S. troop 
uh, collaboration with the so-called rebels who are really terrorists in Syria. Mm, right, he's actually the uh, Assad regime. Well, it's come out now, and this should really tick off the Russians. That the uh, public documents now come out that uh, that he has supported materially, intelligence-wise, and with weapons the so-called Free Syrian Army, which are Al Qaeda and other terrorist organizations that were from Benghazi, Libya, and uh, paid for by the Saudis. Many of them, right, that are right. coming in there as basically mercenaries. There is a process called sabiha. That's the Arabic word, meaning they come into an area, the so-called Free Syrian Army in Aleppo, they line up men and, and teenage boys, and if they won't join the Free Syrian Army, they shoot them on the spot. If they join, many of them are trying to escape that night or the next couple of nights with their guns, trying to run away because they know that if they don't immediately uh, submit, that to join the Free Syrian Army, they're killed on the spot. There's no trial. Or their family, or their family is all is executed. Attacked. Yeah, all of them executed right on the spot. So we have a situation now that's way, way out of control. And uh, instead of helping the situation, we have Hillary Clinton, we have Obama inflaming it more and supplying more arms, and now lining up behind NATO. And NATO has tried repeatedly to, to set up an airstrike uh, attack over. Uh, Syria. The Russians have moved their radar bases over Iran and Syria, the S-300 at least. The, the uh, HK-17, which is the one co-developed with the uh, Chinese, uh, called the S-400 system, I believe is already operationally being either moved there or is in the process of being moved there. And the Russians have moved three different naval uh, vessels down there with 120 troops in each one well, just going uh, to target let, let, let us. Me just, let me just say something about this situation because there are two points to be made. First right. of all, it's not just the Russians who should be ticked off about this, but the United Nations should be. Everybody should be. Obama proclaimed his support for the Kofi Annan mission, the UN mission to get a right. ceasefire. And yet, while he was saying that publicly, privately, he was pouring uh, money, backup support, and encouraging the Saudis to arm these terrorists to conduct warfare against the government of, of Syria and the people of Syria. So, he's now proven in the world to have been a liar. Yeah. Now, Secondly, among the targets of the so-called Salafi, which is the extremely religious Sunni Muslims, who are the ones funded by Saudi Arabia, which includes Iraq al-Qaeda, Libya al-Qaeda, Tunisian al-Qaeda, among their policies are to drive the Christians out of Syria. Right. And when they went into Aleppo, the 10,000 Christians who lived there called on the Assad government to protect them. Right. And this is not being covered in the West. Uh, there were a group of something like 30 Christians who were uh, physically removed from their homes. Several were shot and killed. Uh, this has happened in Homs, in Hula, in Hama, the other cities where we're told about the government's massacres. But in fact, the massacres are being conducted by the so-called rebels. And as you said, there was even a YouTube that came out last week showing beheadings by the so-called rebels who are openly flying the black al-Qaeda flag. And that's who Obama and Hillary Clinton and Cameron of Great Britain want to arm and put in power in Syria. Exactly. Yeah, this is disgusting. It's an impeachable behavior. It is horrifying, and it will bring the world to the brink of World War III. And, and I will say that fast. Ron Paul finally signed on to the Walter Jones 107, HCR 107, which says that any conduct of offensive military action without going to the Congress <clears throat> is an impeachable offense. And we've got to get every congressman to sign that. Otherwise, this president will put us into a war that will not stop at the borders of Syria or Iran, but could include thermonuclear confrontation with Russia. What's going on right now, though, which is not being reported in the news, is how Turkey is going after the PKK in eastern Turkey and try and at war with the northern Iraqi... Uh, Turkey is remember. falling apart. There's a, right. a, an incredible price to pay for exactly. supporting Obama. That's why there's a, there's a free zone inside Syria for the Kurds. And the Kurds in northern Iraq and Turkey are... Welcome back, and uh, lots of remarkable news to cover. 
Uh, Harley, let's continue, please. Well, let's let's pick up on this Turkey question because, you know, the Turkish government of Erdogan has decided to play the role as being the leading force in NATO to overthrow Assad. And there was opposition to this originally, but people pretty much shut up because there's a whole thing in Turkey that in order to be fully accepted in the European Union, they're going to have to show that they're willing to fight NATO's fights. Well, so, if you actually go to the biblical uh, list of nations, Turkey is called Torgrimar of the North Parts, and it's not lined up with NATO in the West. It's lined up with Russia and Islamic countries. So uh, it's my prediction, and this is a geopolitical and biblical prediction, that Turkey will fall apart and Erdogan will be taken over by a military that's pro-Islamic. And, well, that's, uh, and that's where we're heading, because by committing Turkish troops to the border, uh, at the same time the so-called rebel forces in Syria started attacking the cities, Assad made a decision which was to pull back the Syrian border troops so they could defend the cities against the so-called rebels and that created a vacuum. Now it was partly intentional to create a vacuum in the Kurdish areas because the only other organized force in there is the Kurdish separatist movement, the PKK, which exists in northern Iraq, northern Syria and mm -hmm. Uh, southeastern Turkey. Right. And as soon as that happened, the Kurds started fighting for autonomy. And this forced the Turks to have to deploy 10,000 troops into this area. There was a very large fight yesterday. 130 Kurds were killed. I think eight or ten Turkish security forces were killed. But this now has led to an active opposition inside Turkey, where right. they're saying, why are we siding with the West mm -hmm. Uh, in support of al-Qaeda terrorists in Syria. Now, what you talked about, we've already been told by several top diplomats that there may very well be a colonel's coup in Turkey in the near future yeah, by I'm military, yeah. which has in the past always had very good ties with the Assad regime in Syria. Right. And which recognizes that if you have an unleashing of chaos in Syria, which is what would happen if Assad falls, then Iraq would likely have a similar chaos. Iraq already is in chaos. Well, Iraq, is, Iraq has built up a massive military because of their oil resources. And uh, the uh, northern Iraqi Kurds now have an autonomous military that now is in control of their own autonomous territory. And the Iraqi main government can't go in there without the permission of the local Kurdish military. Well, and that's the Kurdish Autonomous Region, which right. is arming the PKK in Syria and Turkey. Exactly. Now, so in other words, what I'm saying is the formation of Kurdistan, eight times more oil than Saudi Arabia, is the real reason that's driving this whole thing. Well, and, and here's the point. Once you start unleashing these kinds of religious fundamentalist movements, like the Saudis are doing, the so-called Salafi or Wahhabite uh, minority uh, Sunni forces to go to war against the Shia, to go a war against at war against the Alawites and the Druze and the Christians. What you've done is you've destroyed any ability of a nation to reflect a national interest. And so, what we're seeing the Saudis unleash is something that will blow apart the whole of the Middle East. Now, here's the irony: Does that make Israel more secure? Of course not. And yet Netanyahu is in a de facto alliance with the extremist Sunni Saudi leadership. And this is why in the last week we've seen an outpouring of warnings from Israeli military and Israeli intelligence. We've had this all along, as you know, for the last months. But this last week... Every single night in the Jerusalem Post, in Yediot Achronot, in all the Israeli papers, there are Ephraim Halevi, for example, former Mossad chief, Mer Dagan, former Mossad chief, uh, even Benny Gantz, who's the current head of the Israel Defense Forces, are saying it would be a mistake for Israel to launch a strike. Now then you have the hypocrite Leon Panetta going into Israel publicly saying, well, we don't want to strike, privately, and, and then saying publicly, but all options are on the table, and then privately assuring Netanyahu of U.S. support. So what Netanyahu is figuring is he has nothing to lose. Now is the time between now and mid-October 
to launch a strike against Iran. And then the only question is, if Obama thinks he's in trouble politically, will he go ahead and launch a follow-up strike to support the Israelis, knowing full well this risks a potential thermonuclear exchange with Russia? So what you're really saying is, let's go backwards uh, in this whole analysis. Yeah. If Obama thinks that either Eric Holder or Geithner could be dissembled, either one or both, then he's going to pull the plug and allow Netanyahu to do a preemptive war and try to apologize his way into a regional conflict that will drive the price of oil to three to five hundred dollars a barrel, uh, cause a thermonuclear firestorm in the Middle East that will destroy millions of people, and release a radiation cloud from Bashir. <clears throat> At the same time, uh, he will ride into the second term of his presidency on the, on the edge of World War III. Well, you know, if one of Romney's issues... And, you know, I, I have very little regard for Mitt Romney as a candidate. He may be a decent person, but he's, he, he's a rotten candidate. Uh, his rottenness is only exceeded by the current incumbent. But if Romney keeps saying the big issue is Obama is not strong enough in support of Israel and strong enough in support of the rebels in Syria, then one of the things Obama can do to cover up the fact that the economy is in a shambles is to launch a strike to say, well, we had to finish the job, the Israelis started it, we couldn't allow it half done, and besides, this just shows what a strong leader I am. I got bin Laden, I got Gaddafi, I got Assad, now I've got Iran. And while some conservatives might fall for that, and some people like John McCain and, and uh, uh, what's his name, Lieberman, are calling for that. In fact, that would be disastrous, not just for the Middle East, but for the whole world. And so we're being held hostage by the craziness of Netanyahu and by the insane policy that Obama continues to follow in the, as an as a anti-Russian, anti-China yeah. policy. Yeah, what I think will happen is if they start a shooting war, the short-range missiles from Hezbollah and Lebanon and the uh, weapons, the RDX high explosive and the VX nerve gas and the fuel air bombs and biological weapons stored in, in Syria, much of them actually transported by Russia uh, with our assent and observation at the same time after Gulf War 1 and 2, are personally designed to make certain that the disaster is maximized. And, and this, they will, this will wipe out Israel. Oh yeah, Israel will cease to exist. The irony of Netanyahu saying that he's the great defender and securer of Greater Israel, <clears throat> presiding over a bigger slaughter of Jews than Adolf Hitler. Exactly, a, a, a sacrifice. The seven million they've been talking about for a hundred years, and yeah. this is what will happen while Israel release unleashes nuclear weapons on any Islamic city within five thousand miles and possibly Moscow. 2,000 miles north, exactly, to the second and minute latitude. Welcome back, and uh, if you're playing this uh, audio... In 2022, if they're still America, it'll probably, if we have another term of Obama, be the Hunger Games. And we'll probably have six regions of whatever population's left after the remnants of World War III, pestilence and depression, spread from the stupidity of our current leadership, who are narcissistic, self-serving maniacs that, who care less about constitutionality, the future of an economy, or the idea that we're on the verge of major leap forwards in not only science, technology, and life extension, but also the natural process of higher levels of an order of an economy where no one's considered unemployed, where we no one has to go without uh, energy, technology, food, or the idea of safety, and where the toxic elements of any, quote, public religion no longer are considered acceptable, including Islam, or toxic politics, where war is the method for geopolitical change on the planet, which has been the watchword for the British Empire for three centuries. Well, Lynn did a speech, Lyndon LaRouche did a speech last Thursday at a diplomatic luncheon where he just made the case that uh, he's made before, but that because of the advances in technology and warfare, an actual 
real war is unthinkable. Because if you put together the Ohio-class submarines that we have, the, the Russian uh, offshore submarine fleet, the existing IBM uh, missile capability, uh, not much would survive in the case of a thermonuclear exchange. It would be a situation where the survivors would envy the dead. Yeah, that's, so that's an ancient saying, isn't it? The survivors yeah. will envy the dead, yeah. And if you start with that as an understanding, and in fact... That's how the military think about it. The reason General Dempsey of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is able to communicate with General Makarov, his counterpart in Russia, is that they do the war games. They've actually seen what would survive a thermonuclear exchange. And as a result, unlike civilian chicken hawks like the Paul Wolfowitzes of this world and the Dick Cheneys, the military people will do anything short of giving up sovereignty to avoid a war. Now, our sovereignty is not threatened by Russia or uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad or the uh, uh, Ahmadinejad regime in, in Iran. Our sovereignty is threatened by our bankers, by our financial institutions, and by our politicians who are in the pocket of those international bankers. And so you get from the military the clearest statements about why we should stay out of Syria, why we should not bomb Iran. Even the Israeli military, whose whole training and whole raison d'etre is to defend the state of Israel against hostile regimes, even they are saying that an Iranian nuclear bomb is not an existential threat to Israel. But an Israeli preemptive strike against Iran might be an existential threat against Israel. And so, you know, you look at these things and you ask yourself, how the hell can Romney talk so easily about uh, ratcheting up the pressure on Iran and Syria? How can Obama send Panetta to Israel and, and tell them everything's on the table, including nuclear strikes? And you see the stupidity the infantile stupidity of these political leaders who are taking the policies from the bankers and not from their military. And I, I have to say, Dr. Deagle, that I'm very yeah. embarrassed by some of the so-called conservatives in this country who go lockstep uh, with this policy because of their fear of so-called militant Islam. The so-called militant Islamic groups that we should be worried about are the ones that our president is allying with. Isn't that crazy? We're actually allying with the people that, they, that the so-called establishment says caused 9-11, is causing all of our IED deaths in Afghanistan and Iraq. And yet we're allying with them and supporting them. These are graduates of Camp X-Ray, uh, and we support them militarily, and intelligence-wise. Even worse than that, we're supporting the people who are <laughs> producing the opium that goes into the heroin in Russia, Europe, and the United States. And we protect the travel, the, the, the production and transportation lines so that our troops won't be shot by the so-called tribal groups so they have their own share of the heroin trade, including Russia, and they will get money to buy more armaments, to buy more IEDs manufactured uh, in Iran and in China and bought for by drugs that we protected their supply lines so that the Taliban and these uh, these tribal groups can continue blowing the arms and legs off our troops and making it impossible to ever get peace. And then Tim Geithner protects the banks that <clears throat> launder the drug <throat> money that's used to buy these weapons. <clears throat> you know, right. this is the lesson of the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Corporation. And you know, I, I don't know if you've ever seen the book that we did on this back in 1978 called Dope Incorporated. Yeah, I, but, I, 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 yeah. in fact I think I have a copy of that. Well, you know, in that book, what we have on the cover is the Union Jack and then a hypodermic needle. Yeah. And what we pointed out is that the current day drug traffic, including the money laundering, goes back to the second opium war against China run by the British in 1859. You know, we, the, uh, not we, but the British in 1839 ran the first opium war, but the Chinese continued to rebel against the British opium that was being shipped into Shanghai, Canton, and Hong Kong. And so there was an uprising in the 18, late 1850s, and Queen Victoria and her Prime Minister Palmerston 
sent the core of the British fleet to shell Shanghai, to uh, Canton, to kill the leaders of the country, not because it was the leaders of China who were resisting the drug trafficking. And they imposed on China a treaty in which the Chinese could not do anything to interdict the flow and, in fact, uh, would, would have to give, uh, allow zones uh, on the border, on the uh, coast, where drugs could be shipped in. And then in 1862, the Bank of Hong Kong and Shanghai was established on Hong Kong as the bank that would be used to deposit the proceeds of the drug trade. And then Hong Shang became a leading London bank. And in the 1960s and 70s, it became a global bank. Now, after we wrote this book, and this is a very important, I, I may seem as though I'm digressing in the history. No, yeah, I'm not, you're not digressing, important. that's why I'm not interrupting. Go ahead. This is, this is something very important. In 1981, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank tried to take over Marine Midland. Do you remember Marine Midland, one of the big six New York banks? Yes. They tried to take it over, and we launched a campaign in New York State to stop it. We went to the New York State banking superintendent, Muriel Siebert, and gave her all the intelligence we had on the fact that HSBC, from its founding, was a drug bank, and it continued to the present day to be the leading bank for laundering drug money. And Muriel Siebert denied Hong Kong Shanghai a permit to take over Marine Midland. So then what Hong Shang did is they got Marine Midland a national charter. So the New York State superintendent had no control over it. And the Federal Reserve under Paul Volcker approved the Hong Shang takeover of Marine Midland. And so to this day, if you fly into Newark Airport or LaGuardia Airport, every single one of the terminals, the uh, gateways, the movable gateways that come out to meet the plane, have the symbol for HSBC on it. Because Hong Kong Shanghai Bank has become one of the leading banks in the world. And it's still involved in drug money laundering. In fact, there are hearings going on right now in the Congress about why it is that the controller, the Office of the Controller of the Currency and the Treasury Department did nothing to move against Hong Shang when a former officer of its New York uh, subsidiary brought in reams of evidence of Hong Shang's involvement in drug trafficking. And one element of the Hong Kong Shanghai drug trafficking, and a lot of their money was coming in from Mexico through their El Paso and San Antonio branches. Exactly. There's evidence that some of this money went to the campaign of Barack Obama in 2008. That's right, and, and a lot of it went through organizations like ACOR. Back in a moment. Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report and uh, Mario Monti's comment. Let's go into that and talk about Europe for a moment because uh, I heard Italy and Spain met some pretty nasty results uh, were the conclusions. It doesn't look like uh, the Europe is long for this world, as they say, economically. And they're trying to push now. This Geithner and his team from Obama's team said over there trying to strong arm Germany. Germany basically, even if they wanted to, can't. There's European uh, Central Bank, even if they took all the money out of Germany, it wouldn't solve the problem. Well, and first of all, it would be illegal under the current German constitution for Germany to do a bailout. Now, this is where Mario Monti comes in. Just to remind your listeners, Mario Monti was a Goldman Sachs operative for a number of years. Then he became a top official in the European Union, European Central Bank. And then when the Italian crisis hit and they ran Berlusconi out of office, they, they imposed Monti as an unelected non-party technocrat to become the Prime Minister of Italy. Now Monti has been doing to Italy what was done to the Greek people, what's being done to the Spanish people, that even though it's not the Italian government that owes the money, it's the Italian banks that are bankrupt, uh, but they're holding Italian government debt. And so Italy and Spain have gone to the IMF and the Troika, the EU, the ECB, and the IMF to get a bailout. 
in return for which they have to impose austerity. Now, austerity means no spending, not just for social programs like health care, uh, uh, university education, police and fire protection, but it means no credit for the banks for local industry or business. <clears throat> yeah. Now, now Italy and you know, Spain you know. just reported today <clears throat> their last year's industrial production figures. In Italy, industrial production is down 8.2 percent compared to June 2011. 8.2 well, percent. If there's anybody else that's a good comic artist. They could, they could show two thumbs over the carotid arteries of Europe about to compress, and now the blood flow to the brain of Europe is down 8.2%. So yeah, it means then, that they're... That's yeah. right. And then Spain, it's down 6.6%. Now, yeah. under those conditions, Spain has 26% official unemployment, 50% youth unemployment. In Italy, unemployment is growing, and Monti is asking the Italian government, parliament, to vote up massive austerity. The Parliament is saying, no, we won't kill our country. So Monte did an interview with Der Spiegel, one of the leading publications in Germany, and he said, look, parliaments are not useful when it comes to economic policy. And he said, we have to rule without parliaments. Now, the reason he's saying that is that parliaments are not going to kill off the people who vote for them. But Monte is saying you need technocratic dictatorships. Now, in Germany, as I said, the, the question's coming up to the Constitutional Court in September, whether these bailouts are legal or not. And the German Constitutional Court, if they were honest, would rule against the bailout because it violates the Grundgesetz, the German basic law, the Constitution, which says that you can't make these kinds of policy changes without a referendum. And so you have some people, uh, Helga Zeppler-Rusch, who runs the Busso party in Germany, which is our political party, has been saying you must have a referendum. And now there are other voices saying that. And the referendum should include a return to regulated banking and so on. So you have throughout Europe a reaction against the austerity. So then you get to what you referred to, the meeting between Rajoy, the Spanish prime minister, and Monti, where both of them were saying... That they don't like the fact that in order to get bailouts, they have to carry out austerity. And so they made veiled threats about it. But then they go back to their governments and say, the only way we can get the bailout is with austerity. And so you're going to see riots in Spain. It, it's expected there's going to be a hot autumn in Italy. Uh, who knows what's going to happen in Germany? Add that to, the, uh, add that to food shortages. Remember the pasta wars a few years exactly. ago? Exactly. The, the food shortages, and then on top of that, if you have some kind of blow up in the Middle East, they're not going to have oil. Right. Well, my guess is here's what I see coming, and this is a virtual certainty. Food prices are going to double or triple by next spring. Oil prices are going to double or triple by next spring because either before or after the, the election, both Obama and Romney have promised Israel that they can attack Iran and Syria. That means that we're facing depression next year and famine, at the very least. Well, and the famine is, you know, there, there are two things about this. In the current farm bill, there's one outrageous aspect to it, is that they're going to try and introduce risk management techniques to farmers so that if their crops fail, they can still make money. That's ridiculous. So That's trying to that turn it into a, a situation where... Yeah, this is not a farm bill. This is not to make... Food. Farmers are not producers that keep people alive. Right. Well, in other words, they want to turn food into a commodity where your business survives, but people that rely on food don't. Exactly. Exactly. And this, this is such an outrage. It is that, ridiculous. That, it's, and this is the reason why American farming is such a mess. And because all the advanced technology has, America has, years ago they could feed... And back in the early 80s, America had two to three years of food stored in massive depots all over the country of food and grain and so on. They could feed the nation for years. And we used to call that a reserve. And then right. these modern economists came in and said, well, that's why farm prices are depressed. Let's call it a surplus and reduce the surplus. Plus. Now, anyone who's read the Bible knows about the idea of seven fat years and seven lean years. Well, but we're now heading toward 14 lean years, and, and the farm sector is being destroyed. Now, one other point, and this is the bigger point, 
in order to deal with something like this drought, we should be going with a crash program for NOAPA, the North American Water and Power Alliance. Yeah, exactly. And again, we were getting a lot of positive response in the Congress last week, on the last two weeks on this. Congressmen who are beginning to realize that you need Glass-Steagall to shut down the bailouts and shut down the corrupt bankers. You need a national credit policy to fund production. And then NOAPA as a job-creating, wealth-producing program. And the, far, the, the Congress was beginning to respond. And I, I'm convinced that the shutdown of the Congress was done by Obama because he didn't want these solutions, number one. And number two, he doesn't want Congress in session uh, at the point in which he gives the go-ahead for ex- expanding the war with Syria and hitting Iran. Yeah. So are your listeners, if they want to understand this, we, they should go to the LaRouche Pack website, LaRouchePack.com. Uh, if they want to do something about it, they should call me at 800-922-2907. And I will return calls if people call me at that number and ask what they can do. So it's 800-922-2907. And then call your congressman's office and tell them to get their asses back into Washington. Don't let Obama blow well, up this country in August. I think that uh, the fact that Obama is manipulating suggests that he's going to give the green light for a war attack in August before September 10th. That's exactly that, uh, what LaRouche is concerned about. Yeah, and I think also the second thing we can take from this is that there's no move to protect us from the radiation release from Fukushima, which is getting worse by the day. They did a war game simulation just a few weeks ago saying within four years the American military would have to help the Japanese. They left logistics in place to evacuate 45 million Japanese the greater Tokyo area if Fukushima blows. <clears throat> they don't have control of the situation there. The situation in Europe is purposely being inflamed rather than dealing with a solution to the problem. And uh, the war in the Middle East isn't even logical. There's no basis for it. Uh, if they wanted to get rid of the missiles that are a, a strategic threat against Israel, you don't do an act of war by declaring uh, the Assad regime a, a, a terrorist organization when you're, you're funding terrorists to come in, and you don't choke off all the ability to sell their oil and goods. It's the only reason why the Strait of Hormuz is still open, because eventually, if we succeed at actually cutting off all the companies that will ship, supply, or even exchange money like the uh, China Bank of Iraq, that does the financial transactions, we guarantee that they will try to close the strait, and they're fully capable against our objections, and it will result in a shooting war that will get way out of hand, and Russia will have to be involved in China. And China will bring in troops across the... The well, they're Kyber not going to bring in troops. If they, if they get into it, it's going to be nuclear. But look, the short-term It'll be nuclear, solution... But you, you always need troops on the ground, though. So what will happen That's is true. it'll be a nuclear exchange, and you'll see massive invasions of millions of Chinese troops coming across the Khyber Pass from, through Iran, which, by the way, China built. Well, the short-term solution <laughs> is to get Obama out of office, and then we can sort out the other things. Exactly. Obama, we have to do an Obamanectomy right <laughs> now. <laughs> Yeah, the, the tumor of Obama in the White House, <clears throat> we have to get Romney to actually fight the fight uh, against because as bad as Obama is, anything but Obama, anything at all. I mean, uh, it's really, really bad. And, all right, uh, well, I'll talk to you next week. Amazing, if we're still all here, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, or in what shape we'll be considering uh, the heat wave and uh, all these other crazy things. Coming up in hour two, our health and wellness hour, Gary Creep, our attorney, will be here talking about the latest move by Obama to uh, literally take over the Internet and completely another attempt by Obama in an executive order, and much, much more. If you don't want to miss it, we'll be back in a moment. Hour two coming up, our health and wellness hour.